Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Harvard Organizational Ethics Consortium. Today's topic is the ethics of hospital transfers in the COVID-19 pandemic, experience and lessons learned. I'm Charlotte Harrison, and I have the pleasure of co-chairing this consortium and co-organizing today's program with our moderator, Matt Winia, whom I'll introduce in a moment. I'm a, an affiliate faculty here at the Center for Bioethics and the Hospital Ethicist at Boston Children's Hospital, where I direct the Office of Ethics and co-chair the Ethics Advisory Committee. I'd like to acknowledge my two consortium co-chairs, one whom you'll hear from later in this program is Dr. Kelsey Berry, Associate Faculty Director of the Masters of Bioethics degree program here at the medical school. She's co-director of the virtual MBE program and a lecturer in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. Our third co-chair is Dr. James Sabin. Jim is a professor of population medicine, a psychiatrist at Harvard Medical School and an early and prominent leader in the field of organizational ethics in healthcare. He co-wrote a highly influential book, Setting Limits Fairly, that many of you will be familiar with, co-authored with Norman Daniels. And he and I had the pleasure of starting this consortium about eight years ago. Um, we so appreciate Jim's continued involvement despite other things that he is uh, working with. Before going further with the introductions and the substance of the program, I wanna turn briefly to how you can participate, which we hope very much that you'll do. So first, if you have a question for the panel, and we hope you will, please submit it through the Q&A feature at the bottom sort of right-hand side of your screen. If you have any technical issues, you can use the chat feature and a staff member will respond to you. Chat's also open for comments that you want to make, but not for questions or we'll, we may be missing them. Okay. Today's program is co-sponsored by our consortium and the University of Colorado Center for Bioethics and Humanities. We're grateful to have that center's director, Dr. Matt Winia, as our moderator today. In a prior life at the AMA, Matt founded its Center for Patient Safety and developed a research and training institute for ethics, professionalism, and policy, among many other initiatives. He's also done extensive work in public health and disaster ethics, and currently serves on the Board of Health Sciences Policy of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Matt's a fellow of the Hastings Center, past president of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities and a past chair of the Ethics Forum of the American Public Health Association. Matt's going to frame today's topic and then turn to our four distinguished panelists. I'm going to briefly introduce them now and then let Matt take it away. Dr. Darlene Taddy is a hospitalist at the University of Colorado Hospital. She's also Vice President of Clinical Affairs with the Colorado Hospital Association. In her hospital association capacity, she's been centrally involved with the statewide hospital transfer arrangements, which she'll be describing. Dr. John Hick is an emergency care physician at Hennepin County Medical Center in Minnesota, where he also teaches in the medical school and has been closely involved in the medical in the Minnesota transfer system. Um, he and two colleagues first proposed a now widely adopted taxonomy that many of you will be familiar with, the three C's, conventional, contingency, and crisis capacity, describing three stages in surge capacity that call for a spectrum of responses in public health emergencies. Elkish Shaw Tulloch is the administrator of the Division of Public Health within the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. Her division leads the response to COVID-19 and she has partnered with the Idaho Hospital Association with respect to the state's hospital transfer arrangements, which she'll be describing. Erin Talati Paquette is a critical care attending and associate director of clinical and organizational ethics at Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. She's also on the faculties of both medicine and law at uh, Northwestern University. So 
So Matt. My turn. I think together <laughs> I'll say thanks for all to all of the panel yeah. for this extraordinary range of perspectives and experience that we know we're going to hear. And it's your turn, Matt, to uh, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much, Charlotte, uh, for uh, the introductions and for sort of laying the stage for us to have what I hope will be a very productive conversation. Um, just as background, um, many of you know, probably everyone knows that hospitals around the country faced tremendous capacity challenges really over the last two years, kind of off and on as different surges have come in in different places. And um, for those of us who've had to manage the triage type questions that have arisen as a result. One of the core issues um, of the ethics of triage is that you never want to do triage and withhold a service from someone when that service would have been available if only they were, you know, 10 miles away at a different hospital. And that sort of core issue of you never want to withhold services from someone thinking there's an absolute shortage when in fact, if you could get them somewhere else, they would be able to get that care. Um, is what drives the conversation today. Um, in many states, not all, but in many states and regions, um, hospitals and health systems have developed really innovative collaborative mechanisms for sharing not just resources, but moving people um, so that they are where the need is, uh, you know, where the resources are available or, or where the need is greatest. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today is what have been some of the um, opportunities, what have been some of the things we've learned, what are some of the things that we've learned during the pandemic that really ought to affect our subsequent ways in which we manage um, resource shortages and so on. We're going to, I hope, be able to get to all of those. But what I've asked the panelists to do by way of um, starting us out is to tell us a little bit about the context locally because yes, everyone had an Omicron surge, but it didn't play out exactly the same way in every um, area. So if you could tell us, you know, what has happened in your region over the last two to four months um, and how has your healthcare environment adapted or managed the, these, you know, massive surges? What are the mechanisms? that your hospitals and health systems have used to try and move patients or resources around to meet the, uh, the need. And if you could incorporate into your um, conversation, because this is an ethics conversation, what do you think are some of the underlying values? What are the ethical principles, if you will, that have sort of underlay um, the actions that, that you've each taken? And if it's okay, I'm gonna pick on uh, Darlene first, because she and I are both in Colorado, and so um, it's the system that I probably know the best, um, and yet I still feel like I have a lot to learn about the actual operations of our combined hospital transfer center. So is it is it okay to start with you, Darlene, and tell us the environment, what have we been doing, and what are the underlying values that you think have driven the decision making? Sure. Uh, Matt, thank you so much, and thank you so much for uh, inviting me to uh, share our experience with our combined hospital transfer center um, with this group. Um, so to start with uh, just some context on what our COVID situation was looking like in Colorado in the past few months, um, we experienced our Delta wave in the fall. So beginning around Halloween of 2021, so end of October, it became apparent that we were going to start to see, again, a rapid increase in the, the number of hospitalizations for COVID as we began to see the uh, community cases of COVID uh, across our state begin to increase very, very rapidly as well. Um, we all had learned from our experience in the year before that typically the hospitalizations um, would follow the cases or the case burden um, within about 10 to 12 or 14 days. So we had this sense that um, the first week of November and into heading into Thanksgiving, that we would be um, facing another surge, beginning to see some of the capacity challenges that we had seen in our prior um, surges back in the winter of 2020. 
um, all over again. Um, what we were then prepared for was to address what we had, would anticipate would be the um, uh, extra pressure on our inpatient settings. And thankfully, a year prior, so in uh, August of 2020, our state had actually begun discussions with our member hospitals um, in the state of Colorado um, to think about how we could work together to move patients throughout our state. Now, I think it's probably helpful to remind everybody that Colorado, we do have um, big urban centers, Denver, uh, Fort Collins, Colorado Springs, and um, uh, these urban centers are uh, where many of our health systems and larger hospitals are housed. Um, however, we have a very significant portion of our state, which is rural or even frontier, where um, we have uh, less access to healthcare just because we have critical access hospitals and rural hospitals, but not large uh, systems. Um, but the key here is, is that our geography adds an, an, uh, an additional, um, what I would say barrier or uh, factor to consider. So in the winter, our, our mountains beca can become impassable. Um, roads close and uh, with winter storms, it, air travel or um, emergency air travel for transferring patients can also become very challenging. So um, with that anticipation of our winter, uh, pos the possibility of a winter surge in 2020, the state had already asked our hospitals to begin thinking about how we might be able to move patients from these more remote locations um, into settings where they could get the care that they would potentially need and to have a plan in place to do that. That request um, gave birth to the Combined Hospital Transfer Center or what we shortened to the CHTC. Um, again, Combined Hospital Transfer Center because what it did was it pulled together the transfer centers of all of our uh, larger health systems. So we have five major health systems in Colorado um, that have multiple hospitals within their systems. And then um, about 42 rural independent hospitals throughout our state. And the idea behind the combined hospital transfer center was that the um, transfer centers of these larger health systems mm -hmm. would work together to plan for and move uh, large numbers of patients from our rural areas into, mm -hmm. you know, who, who are needing care or who un are unable to provide care, whether for it's a capability reason or a capacity reason, move those patients into our, our larger urban systems. Um, so fast forward now, we're now in 2021, in the fall of 2021, and we were again in the situation where we could see that we would begin to face a surge um, in the fall, um, which in this case was our Delta wave. And um, the, with that, we had already begun to experience some of these rising numbers and the CHTC was activated again in November, um, the second week of November, early November. And what the activation of the CHTC entailed was bringing together the transfer center leads of the large health systems within our state and then begin to capture data on what the real time capacity was. So what's the bed availability? And very specifically, what's the staff bed availability within our state hospitals? Um, where are patients or which hospitals are facing capacity challenges? Where are patients that have COVID um, that need potentially to be transferred? And where might there be the available bed that that patient can be transferred to? So the convening of these um, transfer center leads of our health systems brought together that data, brought together that real time and um, very uh, nuanced understanding of what the capacity situation was at the front lines of their individual facilities, and then allowed them because of their expertise to make decisions about which patients needed transfer when, how immediately, and then which bed and which hospital was the most appropriate bed for that patient. The ethical principle underlying this map was that we wanted to make sure that every Coloradan who needed acute care and COVID care could get that care when they needed it. And that we would never have a Coloradan in a place, in a setting where they were getting, not getting the care that they specifically needed in that moment. Um, 
I think the important thing about the combined hospital transfer center was that it was never mandated by the state. It was a completely voluntary um, uh, decision to create, to maintain, to build, and to, to, to uh, carry out the function of it um, by our uh, transfer center leads. Um, the combined hospital transfer center had three levels of activation with increasing intensity that relied on triggers of how dire was the capacity situation in our state. Um, by the third or fourth week of November, it became clear that our capacity situation this fall was significantly worse than it had been the year before in 2020, because in addition to having a surge of COVID patients in our hospitals, we were also facing a significant staffing shortage um, because of what we know happened nationwide, which is the, the loss of healthcare staffing, um, nursing, uh, nursing staff, respiratory therapists, EMS, um, and uh, of course those certainly um, diminished the number of beds or available beds that we had across the state. Um, so the CHUC actually was activated to the highest, most intense tier, where basically every available bed in Colorado was on deck to potentially receive a transfer. Um, we were able to activate reverse transfers, meaning as patients were recovering or getting better in one hospital that was a higher level of care, that patient could actually be transferred back to potentially a rural hospital for lower level of care and ongoing um, convalescing care or uh, recovery care. Um, so by December, we began to see the Omicron surge in our state, which added to the pressure. Um, and um, in those weeks between November and February, um, and, and through that uh, Delta surge and Omicron surge, we transferred almost um, 45,000 total patients among our rural and urban hospital systems. Um, so uh, Matt, I'm gonna close there. Uh, I hope that gives enough of an overview and a little bit of detail on the way our combined hospital transfer center worked in Colorado. Thank you so much. Um, that, uh, I have so many questions, but I wanna get through our opening comments by everyone. So I will come back to you though, and um, just to, to put a tag on the issue of requirement because uh, there were newspaper articles that suggested, you know, not only could people be transferred in Colorado um, it, without their first having given permission, the patient's permission, um, but also that hospitals would be required to accept patients in transfer. Uh, so I wanna come back to that because that has been, that sort of the autonomy of both patients and institutions, I think is one of the ethical issues we wanna dig into. But first, I'm gonna to turn to Elke next. Um, Darlene is from the Hospital Association. She's also an academic, also a clinician. Um, but Elke, you are with the state of Idaho and you had maybe the most famous um, rollout of, um, of crisis standards of care across the country. I mean, there were a few. Um, but Idaho experienced an enormous um, and very rapid uh, escalation of a surge, um, which required very rapid response on your part. And you're with the state of Idaho. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to get that sort of other, the other side of this, right? Uh, we, we just heard about the experience on the part of the hospital association and the hospitals. What was this like um, from the point of view of the state trying to provide some framework and coordination around? around this in Idaho. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, it seems like in, in listening to Darlene, we could, you know, many of the issues that, of course, we were dealing with are very much similar to what's happening in Colorado. Um, I want to take a, a quick step back and at least set the stage a little bit about the state of Idaho. Um, because we do, you know, we're a huge state geographically and we have, you know, kind of three disparate, uh, kind of disparate areas of the state that almost um, are their own systems, if you will. So it, it, that posed some challenges as well, but just a little bit of history from Idaho. Really at the start of the pandemic, we didn't have a crisis standards of care plan finalized. Uh, we had just transitioned all of our um, hospitals from a seven regional healthcare coalition to a three healthcare coalition um, 
uh, structure uh, through our preparedness program. And we certainly didn't have those day-to-day -day working relationships with our hospitals as we do now. Uh, we had already a really great relationship with our Idaho Hospital Association, um, but we were just, you know, a little bit hit and miss in terms of working with the hospitals. There was really great um, local participation, but in terms of bringing everybody together at a statewide level, not not quite there. Um, those regional conversations didn't give us that kind of equitable visibility across the state and what was happening. Um, and as I mentioned, we had a very you know, geographically diverse state and it's very much a local control state. So all that sort of played into how we were functioning originally. Um, and we saw, like you said, a, a kind of a dramatic increase in cases in our Delta wave, which really struck us um, the hospital settings um, from the perspective of there just an overflow of patients coming into the hospital settings. And then uh, kind of with the Omicron surge, it was a bit of a different um, scenario with the hospitals. So we had uh, kind of like, as Darlene was saying, we still had high hospital census, but with Omicron, it was stressing the, the hospitals a little bit differently than it was with Delta in the sense that the Omicron surge was really impacting staffing tremendously more than it did in the, the early days with the Delta wave. Um, we had large number of staff out across the state um, that were out sick themselves. They were caring for sick family members or even supporting their children who are home because of uh, school closures and isolation requirements. Uh, in this, excuse me, in January of this year, we wound up declaring crisis standards of care for the third time um, during the pandemic. So our first time of declaring crisis standards of care was back in September. And we really did that on a regional basis because, um, like I mentioned, our geography is so um, spread out. It's a, it's a huge number of hours and um, even from a flight perspective or driving perspective to get from one part of the state to the next, big mountain ranges in between, um, and just trying to figure out how best to deal with patient transfers was, was a challenge. Um, what we were seeing in the north part of the state was not what we were seeing in the southern or eastern part of the state. So our original crisis standards of care, care declaration came clear back in September with a regional approach. And then um, a few weeks later, it wound up being a statewide approach. And that was really um, because of the, the number of patients that were in the hospital. In November uh, timeframe, we did a deactivation status um, first at the statewide level and, and, and then finally the, excuse me, the regional level and then the statewide level in December. And then with the Omicron surge, we wound up having a second wave of declarations, if you will, in January, January 24th um, was a different part of the state this time. It was our Southern part of the state requesting a hospital requesting crisis standards of care due to severe staffing limitations and uh, the different scenarios, um, the critical blood supply shortage that they were facing and this hospital that initiated this this time is our largest um, trauma hospital. So just a little bit more of a history um, about how we were organized. So um, over time with these activations and deactivations, as I said, we started not really having, you know, coordinated effort at play. Um, we've since then created a, a great voluntary and sort of relational model, I'm calling it, throughout the pandemic to support the hospitals with the response, including their transfers. And um, the evolution of the model kind of goes like this. <laughs> so we at the state, we convened our, uh, what we call our hospital capacity calls multiple times a week uh, throughout the, the whole uh, pandemic so far, just to create that statewide situational awareness. They're co-hosted with our Idaho Office of Emergency Management and our Idaho Hospital Association. Um, the state then also convened our State of Idaho Disaster Medical Advisory Committee in the very early stages of the pandemic to create our crisis standards of care plan and our patient care strategies for care resources um, guidelines that was based on Minnesota's plan. So I'm glad that John is on here uh, to help provide guidance for hospitals, um, which of course is all laid out under an ethical framework. So for several months, we were working with our hospitals, kind of helping them navigate in this sort of loose relationship um, and, and really letting the hospitals navigate these issues amongst themselves uh, regionally. We did not have a state 
a collective body that had the skills and expertise to be that single center um, helping. But what we did do last summer in July is that um, we had a hospital that ran into a situation of needing help with a transfer, a patient transfer. They were doing their normal, you know, we're making 24 calls trying to find a play, way to transfer this patient. We need EMS to help us. So we have a very robust state communication center that can quickly convene calls. We have great protocols that are, are available through that state comm center. So we pulled them all together to help with problem solving. We had all the EMS and hospitals in that region available, helped them do that problem solving, got the transfers made, a transfer made. And then in August, we had our hospitals during one of our capacity calls that I mentioned, um, talk about the need to expand that load leveling um, across the entire state. Instead of making it just regional, we needed to be able to do some sort of statewide effort. So we, the state, then created um, a medical operations coordination cell call platform, if you will. We have a call every single day, 30 minute call in this mock or medical operations cell uh, coordination cell structure that brings together the transfer centers from the hospitals, um, some of their administrations some bedside physicians, whomever they think are the appropriate people to be in these calls. We facilitate them, we have an agenda. They, each of the hospitals report on key kind of metrics, whether that's available beds, transfer needs, blood supply, uh, whatever, whatever it is that we need to be talking about. We also have our Idaho uh, inventory or our resource tracking system. We can also walk through to see bed availability. So during these calls, daily calls, there is constant communication, consultation, um, requests for assistance, and we try to connect those needs during the day, uh, during that call, if a solution can be obtained, uh, where there's some great, you know, they'll start exchanging phone numbers and conversations in the chat. They'll call each other afterwards, but if they can't, um, support that during that quick call. We've also created what's called the Alert Sense app. So a few weeks after we started these coordination cell calls, we found there was a need to, to make this available 24-7. So we worked with our vendor called Connexus to build out their Alert Sense app um, to allow push messages and polling options within that app to help with load leveling. So we can then see, even pop up on our phones and the state's also involved, where we can see, you know, X hospital has patient X, Y, and Z that needs to be transferred for the following reasons. And then that allows uh, uh, reciprocating hospitals to respond to that 24 seven. We also have staff available to help facilitate if those calls should go unanswered. Um, and then that, I just wanted to kind of wrap up with a couple of things um, that, that medical operations cell coordination process, along with our, our healthcare capacity calls that we're having, um, while we don't have a very, you know, a, a structure at the state level where we have, you know, physician team physically, you know, making those uh, calls on how a patient should be transferred, we do have an environment where we have all the players at the table on a daily basis and, and at the leadership level multiple times a week where we've been able to create this environment of trust, accountability, relationship building, that's really led to a lot of transparent and collective problem solving, mentoring, support, resource sharing. Uh, we even had some of our largest competitors that are famous for, even for some, some of their competition, really working together as a team. They've shared uh, blood conservation protocols with all the hospitals. Um, they'll say, does anybody have any needs? Here's how we can help you. Um, so that's sort of the environment that we have right now, and I'm, I'm sure that as we get through, you know, further into the conversation, there's a lot more that we can talk about in terms of that ethical framework. But really, the, the platform is just like you mentioned at the very beginning. We don't want anyone in our state to to go without care and have set up a structure that really allows that like instantaneous, almost conversation across the hospitals. Excellent. Um, you know. Again, I, oops, sorry, I have to restart my video. Uh, uh, you also have raised, you know, uh, half a dozen different things that I'd love to dig into a little bit more. Um, and so just as a, as a, again, because I gave, uh, I gave Darlene a marker for something I'll definitely want to ask you about later. Um, think about the um, across the state issues. 
because mm -hmm. that that is kind of where I would like to uh, also ask John Hick to weigh in as as he put, turns his video on and we um, and we move to uh, to his perspective. John, I think you've maybe as much as anyone in the country done um, more thinking around how to make these kinds of systems actually functional. And in particular, the issues of cross state transfers. I think we've we've heard from both Colorado and Idaho, both of whom have some of these unique geographical issues, but it turns out they're not that unique because I know you've dealt with some of these same issues um, in, in your state, which of course has a similar geographic uh, makeup in terms of you know, big mountains and a lot of barriers to moving people around all that easily. Um, so what's been the what's been the circumstance in your area and um, and how have you managed it? What have been the underlying um, ethical principles driving that? Yeah, thanks, Matt. It's um, you know, we, we don't have any mountains in Minnesota. We got uh, 10,000 lakes we have to circumvent. That's what it is. You know, so I knew um, there was something. You no, know, and there's always there's always cross border you know transfers and issues. Those are happening every day from Western Wisconsin, you know, in and from our state into South North Dakota and vice versa. So, um, you know, it's it's complicated, no question. I think it's been the best of times and the worst of times. You know, we. Between the late Delta uh, surge that we got moving right into the Omicron surge, we started up on our case counts in June of 2020, and we are just now, you know, coming down. I think we're, we're still on the way down, but we still have well over 600, you know, COVID cases hospitalized, and that's a significant undercounting because once they get past their infectious period, they, they don't count on the numbers anymore. So the, the longer term players in the ICU, you know, aren't really showing up on those counts. So I'm glad to be on the way down, but man, it's been a long six months of, of really protracted stress on the healthcare system. So we're fortunate to have pretty robust healthcare coalitions in eight regions of the state. And those came together along with the Minnesota Hospital Association and the Minnesota Department of Health early on to form the statewide healthcare coordination center. We recognized pretty much right away that we were going to need um, basically a, a one call system to you know, place patients in available beds. So we came up with a critical care coordination center or C4. And for a time that was run uh, out of the state EOC and a forwarded you know, phone number, but we realized that with the ebbs and flows of COVID-19, we needed that to be embedded in a, in a patient transfer center. So the state contracted with M Health uh, Fairview Systems that has multiple hospitals and has a robust system operations center where we could you know, run that call center out of. So uh, that call center then was designed to be used when the usual referral methods, like you called your usual partner and if they said, no, we, we got nothing for you, uh, then you could call the C4. Um, and so the C4 also, in addition to that call function had either three times a week to once a week to daily touch bases uh, with the major systems. That was an invaluable platform for sharing subjective as well as objective information. We coupled that with a real-time bed board uh, that was put together that was utilized very heavily, uh, as well as evolving consensus on you know, what constituted crisis staffing, uh, what were we going to do about you know, agreements on non-emergency procedures and, and how to ratchet those back, because those that created quite a bit of controversy during the first uh, surge because when we looked at the acuity of the patients in the ICUs, the number of patients intubated and things like that, it was pretty clear that a couple of the systems were, were continuing to do significant numbers of elective cardiac procedures that, um, you know, I think the, the relative risk analysis and, and benefit of those has to be very carefully calculated. But when you're essentially out of ICU beds, uh, and it's very clear there's a very disproportionate distribution of acuity you know, across the hospitals, then, then something needs to be you know, done about that. And so you know, that led to some pretty you know, difficult conversations, but we got that worked out. Um, early on, we were really blessed during the, the governor's declaration of emergency, we had critical care physicians available to help uh, broker transfers when beds were not available and help prioritize transfers when we had multiple transfers pending. Um, we also had an agreement amongst the hospitals on a rotation system by which if the critical care physician felt that the, the patient could not receive the care they needed in place at the hospital they were at, usually a critical access or smaller you know, community hospital, that we could essentially force a transfer to a larger facility. Once the governor's declaration went away, um, the healthcare systems backed away from you know, that plan and, and you know, it kind of 
it wound up being a problem you know, during Delta and Omicron because we wound up in much more of a first come first serve situation that we were not uh, intending. Um, so I think a number of things. One, you know, in the end, I think the C4 was a success in a lot of ways from August of 2020 through the end of 2021. Uh, it handled about 5,000 requests for transfers. Um, of those, 2,851 were ICU transfer requests, and we placed uh, 1,073 of those. So about two thirds of the requests were placed, but some months we had a 92% success rate, like May of last year, and then a 16% placement success rate uh, in December, which tells you that we had a lot of patients, you know, sitting in the hospitals awaiting transfer. So at that point, we you know, changed our policies so that we would only accept transfer requests from hospitals that did not provide uh, tertiary ICU services to really focus our requests on those patients who would most benefit from transfer. And we were successful in getting a hospitalist to help prioritize those transfers. But without a mechanism to get the systems to accept those patients, the larger systems, we, we still had a lot of situations where the providers were, were you know, quite desperate uh, to get their patients into a higher level of care. And that was very morally you know, distressing uh, and problematic. So a few things over the, the course of you know, the last six months, um, just to reflect on it, I think there's been a lot more welcome uh, discussion of end of life issues you know, with patients on admission to the hospital. I think we also need to have discussions around consent to transfer uh, at the time of admission, because we ran into, even though we wanted to reverse transfer uh, folks out of the tertiary centers, a lot of times the families would refuse. Um, we had issues with EMS system reimbursement. Um, and so we wound up having to use, you know, federal transport or, or mechanism, disaster reimbursement mechanisms to pay uh, for those transfers. And a lot of times the systems did not want, you know, the patients to be transferred out of system. So even though we felt we had some way to kind of open the drain uh, a little bit, that was a problem. Honestly, that wasn't as big a problem on the back end as trying to get patients into long-term care facilities. Uh, and that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother day, um, but, but a huge issue. Uh, I do feel though that the ability to load balance and the ability to get patients transferred to the correct level of care is the number one thing that we can do to establish equity you know, during these type of incidents. And it is incumbent on us to, to get the mechanisms figured out by which we can manage these transfers. Um, during the early, the first surge, we saw a disproportionate impacting of our urban centers and our, our minority you know, populations, our non-majority populations. Um, that was particularly exacerbated by the civil unrest that followed George Floyd's murder. And so we actually used the C4 to help uh, load balance a couple of our urban trauma centers that were already full with COVID. And for example, I worked one of those shifts and we admitted 26 patients to the trauma service uh, in, in the space of 12 hours. You know, we just did not have room to accommodate uh, that many casualties. And so we had to make transfers out to other hospitals and we're grateful for the cooperative agreement to do that. Um, I do really fear that, that Patients did not, in a lot of situations, get um, equivalent care at the smaller hospitals they were at, and that um, a number of implicit triage decisions were made, which we would really prefer to avoid, um, and make sure that we're providing a level of consistency and, and accountability and awareness of resources um, that will avoid that. Um, patient prioritization is key, uh, as I mentioned. Um, and I think, too, we really need to start thinking more carefully about who not only who benefits the most uh, from advanced care, but who will suffer the least if such care is withdrawn. And, and some of you may have seen we had a case, well, we had um, pretty large lists of patients waiting to be transferred into you know, tertiary centers. We had a patient who, in the interpretation of the care teams, was receiving futile care for COVID, had been hospitalized and, and intubated, receiving maximal support for months. Um, the uh, care team, you know, told the family that that they, you know, wished to withdraw care because it was futile, and the family obtained a restraining order from the court, um, you know, forcing the the hospital to continue to ventilate him. The family was successful in getting him transferred to Texas, where he died within days of, of arriving there. But it just really, I think, um, overtly raised the question of: Do we allow an individual infinite access to? You know, resources despite a futile outcome or even in cases where there is competition for resources, are, are we providing inappropriate care 
uh, in some cases in the ICU, while others in you know, rural hospitals are suffering the consequences of not having access to those services. So a very pointed um, example a few weeks ago about the, the competition for these resources. So we got a lot of work to do. I think we've done a lot of good work. Um, I think we've got to get better about our, our policies and protocols, about our triggers uh, for crisis, about our agreement on restrictions and non-emergency procedures. Um, all of these things I think will help reduce our, our providers' moral distress, will restore confidence to the patients that they're getting the best care that's possible, um, and you know, hopefully result in, in you know, more consistent response next time. I think we put a lot of good tools in place, but uh, no question we can refine them in the future. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna turn now to Aaron, um, even though just like the other two, John has raised a couple of really important issues that we're gonna to have to return to, in particular, those difficult conversations around so-called elective procedures. And also I think we'll, we'll probably wanna come back to some of the challenges around transfers to long-term care facilities, because I think all of us have probably had to address those issues as well. But Aaron, um, let me turn to you. You do not have mountains in Chicago. Um, and so there are not so much that, that kind of literal geographic barriers to transfers, but I know that you also around the Chicago area really faced some of the problems later on that were so prevalent in New York very early in the pandemic, where you knew that there were beds available in some locations, but you know blocks away sometimes there were places that were completely swamped and unable to make those transfers. So how has the health system or the set of systems around uh, the Chicago area and Illinois manage these recent surges? Thanks, Matt, um, for the question and the opportunity to, to share among this group of speakers that have had such phenomenal experience at their um, state and local levels with managing um, uh, transfers and resource utilization throughout the pandemic. I will have to say the best that I could describe um, the experience, and I'll, I'll speak to Chicago because we are a state, but um, one of the things that I want to highlight is the best way I could describe the uh, the experience is the uncoordinated um, response to COVID-19, because there um, there has not been really a central, uh, throughout, throughout this, there hasn't been a central um, site that has uh, assisted with direct transfer of patients. Um, I'll say patients specifically because there are there is within um, our state system a catastrophic response plan that includes, um, I believe as Alki spoke to, includes regional um, areas where hospitals that are in crisis standards of care can reach out to their regional coordinating center for assistance with resources which may call on um, national uh, national stockpiles or otherwise in order to promote, to provide resources to that institution. But it doesn't necessarily help with issues of, uh, specific issues of staffing and patient transfer. Um, so I, I do wanna highlight as, um, as John spoke to that, you know, one of the things we were battling in the city of Chicago is that just six months before the pandemic hit, we were already talking about how the lifespan gap across um, a few miles within the city was, um, vaster than any other place in the country. And that uh, a large part of this is what was whether um, all groups were getting adequate access to attaining um, their best health, including access to hospital systems that um, were sufficient for what their needs were. As the um, initial COVID um, surge uh, struck in early 2020, there were calls that individual hospitals might need to enter um, crisis standards of care. And that's the first point that I'll highlight is that within our state, despite there being a catastrophic response plan and a requirement that all individual hospitals have disaster response plans, it fell to the individual hospital and was declared by the state that the individual hospital was best suited to know when it would enter crisis standards of care. Now, what that left you with is that if a local or a community hospital felt that it was in crisis standards of care and wanted to reach out for help to other larger hospital systems, those hospital systems may not be experiencing that same strain at that same period of time. And there was no local or regional um, declaration that the region was in crisis standards that might promote individuals turning to those disaster plans and being more um, 
I think, amenable to working together to ensure that across that local or regional area, wherever that crisis um, was declared, that those um, resources, including um, staffed beds, were shared appropriately. So that's the first point that I that wanted to make is that, you know, I think declaration at the individual hospital level really um, puts much more of an onus on those hospital systems to, um, to be able to coordinate resources, uh, which I think could be better done where, um, uh, where there's a central coordinating system. Um, the second point I wanted to make is that, you know, over the course of the pandemic, many of us, uh, so I'm an, I'm an ethicist, I chair our ethics committee and um, I direct our organizational ethics for the hospital. Those of us on the ethics side were watching the pandemic unfold and watching maps of the city of Chicago that began to mirror that lifespan map where um, we saw higher cases in areas um, of uh, lower um, resource availability. We saw higher deaths in those same environments. We knew there was um, less, um, you know, through anecdotal stories, we knew there were less access to resources. Many of the hospitals um, were uh, uh, reaching out for help and not able to, not able to get it. So um, concordant with the initiation of the pandemic, um, our uh, one of the members actually at our hospital found it was what has become known as the Chicago Bioethics Coalition, which was a voluntary group of individuals that came together across more than 12 healthcare systems and involved more than 50 people to share um, ideas and resources about what was happening at individual hospitals and to try to bring back in our respective roles within the hospital, um, basically please to the um, to the leadership to help with a more coordinated response. We were anecdotally hearing stories that there were, you know, people lined up at doors and in um, hallways that were clearly in need of higher level resources in community hospitals and that some of those hospitals were calling six, seven, eight times. This was written about in a, in a few articles and, um, and op-eds that came out around this time that, you know, they're you know, there were, there were people that were begging for resources and hospitals that were begging on their behalf, but it was reliant upon the individual um, uh, receiving hospitals to accept those patients. Um, I would love to say that over the course of the surges of the pandemic, um, there's been a change in the way that's been approached. Um, and unfortunately, I, I, can't, I can't tell you that that's the case. What I can tell you is that there have been, you know, what we've learned, I think, a bit through this pandemic is that sometimes you have to insert yourself into um, local, regional, or, or more organized public health um, processes in order to try to get a voice at the table and to move things along. So as part of this coalition, one member of our coalition sat in on weekly calls that were held by the Chicago Department of Public Health that um, you know, were designed to discuss what's the availability of resources. There was through that system, um, a bed availability uh, database that was created, but there were no um, uh, facilitating initiatives to have clinicians or other people prioritizing individuals for transfer based on what that bed availability is at the different systems. Um, so what ended up happening, I think, within individual systems was decisions about things, some of the things that John raised, um, uh, including whether or not, again, to um, uh, to hold or halt uh, elective uh, ser services, surgical services during this time, um, rather than um, potentially being able to move patients and free up um, bed availability. I will say on the pediatric side, there was an agreement among um, children's facilities that um, the one of the local hospitals, the one that I work at, which was the largest children's facility in the area, would try to decompress adult systems by taking additional pediatric patients. And, the, uh, and an adult hospital also, one of the adult quaternary care facilities also made um, a, a statement that they would make their beds available to patients that needed transfer. They very quickly filled up. We did not. Um, and I think that raises another issue to talk about, which, which is what, it, what are the barriers to facilitating um, transfer of patients when you have systems, which I believe many of us operating operate in, where individual hospital systems have this catchment area that they generally serve. People see that as their hospital. How do you get them to 
in a stat in a setting where there may be other hospitals in crisis, how do you get them to agree to transfer even to a, a facility of equal level, um, but that is not their home facility. So I think how we think about public messaging in these situations and quickly making the public aware of the need to sort of um, allocate resources where they're needed, which may not be along the usual lines of care, um, it is really um, important. Um, and the last thing I, I think that I'll say is um, that, you know, one of the things we found um, important to getting our voice heard was uh, uh, different people actually stepping into um, meet public media. So um, write, writing up ads about the, the problems that were existing in the, in the city, the difficulties with allocating resources appropriately. Um, and, and then alongside that, um, reaching out to our local representatives um, and uh, you know, being very clear about the fact that the responsibility um, was on us to coordinate resources between institutions and local regional public health um, authorities and government authorities to ensure that if things weren't happening on a voluntary basis, um, that more coordinated efforts needed to happen. It, many of those conversations are still ongoing. Um, I, like John, uh, you know, fear that as we're starting to see, you know, our surge decline, we've hit our lowest, um, you know, percent positivity uh, in the last couple of days, and are now lifting some of the, um, you know, other mask mandates and other measures that were put in place. I worry that the impetus to continue those conversations will also wane. Um, but that, um, you know, but I, but I'm. There's, a, there's some hope in me that trying to continue them will put us in a better position when, when the next crisis hits. Uh, once again, uh, a lot to chew on there. Um, let me start my video. And actually, I'll ask everyone to go ahead and restart their videos. We've got some really good questions um, coming in through the Q&A. Um, but I would actually like to go back to one thing that I think all of you mentioned in one way or another. Elke, it most stood out. Uh, to me in your comments where you said someone had done the usual thing and made their 20 different phone calls trying to find a place to transfer. Um, and it struck me because the, um, the, the primary motivation, uh, as Darlene told us, of all of these systems is to make sure people don't sit in one location where they're unable to get the services that they really need and are moved as quickly as possible. But there is a second motivation here, um, which you know, is about the fact that you've got limited numbers of providers who are really you know, struggling to keep up with the work and they are spending hours on the phone looking around for a place to send a patient. It's a terrible use of their, of their time. Um, and I'm just wondering, did, that, did anyone track that? Like, was that a success metric? for any of these transfer centers that, that the people who were using it on the, on the provider side found that it was an efficient way um, and that it actually saved them time and allowed them to provide better care to the people they were responsible to. Um, and or did you, you know, anecdotally see that it was successful in terms of people saying, yeah, I, didn't, I love that I don't have to make 20 calls, I make one call. And I, I guess I'll just open that to, to anyone, or at least the, the three of you that have experience with a formal transfer center, was that an explicit aim? And if so, did you track uh, in terms of your success in meeting that aim? Yeah, Matt, I'll just say it was a specific aim for sure, because uh, usually, especially in the small hospitals, it's a solo provider. Yeah. A tremendous waste of time for them to be making, you know, 50 phone calls. Um, so when we did send out a survey, you know, last year and just said, you know, what, how has this helped you? That was definitely a strong message was um, that has been a time saver and, and a great help. Now, I will say that as our placement success decreased, um, I think the trust that mm -hmm. they were going to get a bed also decreased and people would not only lodge uh, a referral request with C4, but then they would continue to call around also the places. Oh. Um, and I think, you know, part of the problem was a lot of the health systems um, the, you know, hospital operator, the transfer center operator would just flat out, you know, tell the, the referring doctor no. Um, and it, it never got through to uh, a clinician. Um, our health system always, you know, allows the clinician to speak to a clinician. 
And so a lot of times we were able to negotiate, you know, something with them or, or figure something out, or I could give them a direct contact at a different healthcare system. Uh, and usually once the, the need for the referral was understood, whether it was dialysis or emergent surgery or things like that, um, if it really needed to happen, we figured out a way to get it to happen, but it was usually on the basis of personal relationships. And mm -hmm. um, so I, so the system worked to a point. And then after that, it kind of came down to uh, pleading your case to as many people as you could. Matt, um, that was actually one of the main reasons that we were asked by the state to do this was because uh, one of the initial cries from our rural hospitals was that we are overrun with these transfer requests and we it's taking us 16, mm -hmm. 17, 18 hours to get a patient safely to um, a, a facility that can actually provide the care that they need. Um, the tier one uh, activation of the CHTC or the Combined Hospital Transfer Center in Colorado uh, was specifically meant to solve that issue. And the way that that tier one worked was that each rural hospital, every single, all 42 rural hospitals were um, selected a preferred hospital partner or system partner that was then their first and only call. And uh, those hospital systems committed to that rural hospital that if we can't find a bed for your patient in one of our facilities in our system, we will work with the other systems to uh, find a place, find a home for your patient in their system. So that the onus and a responsibility of making all those 500 phone calls <laughs> went to the system that had a lot more staff um, and, a, and a dedicated transfer center to do that work. I, I think initially some of the things that um, were ch became challenging was that rural hospitals at the front line, like their overnight docs, you know, their ED docs or their hospitalists who were on, um, didn't necessarily get the memo that you now just have to call, you know, there's just oh. one call you have to make. So they were still doing the process where they would call eight hospitals or eight system, you know, all systems just to get the call out there, um, which then made it, um, challenging because that all those systems would start to work on finding a bed only then to find out that okay that that hospital's partner is actually um system a uh and so um that was one of the hurdles that we had to get through but the feedback um after four months of activation has been that the relationship between that individual rural hospital and that system has become that much stronger and um, now with mo much more facility and understanding that process and who is our one partner, um, it's they're, they're, people are very happy with it. That's interesting. John, you put in the chat that you thought about this, but the rural hospitals actually balked. Um, can you tell us what happened? Why would they balk? Yeah, so, so the independent hospitals, we had kind of a similar system set up when the hospitals were affiliated with a parent system. When they weren't, we offered to those hospitals to basically establish a you know a partnership that it's like you guys would be linked, um, you know, for the purpose of the pandemic. And and basically through the Minnesota Hospital Association, they said no, um, we don't want to do that. Uh, we feel that will restrict our options, and you know we're we're you know we're we'd we'd be more comfortable kind of going on our own on our own with the C four. Huh. Th this go it alone. Um thing just keeps coming back as a theme, right? That um, the idea that the best way to manage a pandemic is to let each hospital decide how they want to manage their piece of the pandemic. Um, and and it, I mean, this, is, this isn't just this part of the pandemic, right? This has been a larger societal conversation about to what extent can we cohere as a community and make shared plans? And to what extent are we each, you know, the Lone Ranger? making our own decisions. Uh, so this is a reflection of that larger conversation. And Matt, what I will say is there was tremendous divergence between the um, emergency department clinicians who sort of the bedside to the boardroom. Um, you know, mm -hmm. what the CEOs, you know, wished for and, and, you know, wanted to implement was often very different from what the frontline providers were asking for. And sorting out that, that dichotomy and that discrepancy and, um, it was very challenging from the Minnesota Department of Health trying to figure out what the ask was, um, you know, from the hospitals because they were being hit with so many mixed messages, um, you know, from different from the administrative level versus the clinician level, 
and certain systems were coping better than others. And so, you know, when are you going to clear, when are you going to declare a crisis? What are you going to do versus why are you talking about the fact that, you know, we're, we're struggling? Um, that's going to make patients think the care is unsafe. That's not the case. So uh, I, I felt badly, you know, for everyone, but the, the amount of mixed communications was extraordinary. Yeah. Um, I want to get to a, a, a number of people now have asked about this issue of requirements around transfers. And I think there's two aspects to that. Um, the one that came up immediately was, what about patients who would rather not be transferred? And I know we've definitely dealt with this here in Colorado, but I expect others have as well. And, and John, you gave us maybe the paradigm example, sort of the worst case example, where someone is you know, literally refusing and going to court. Um, but how, ha how have e each of the systems, I guess, that we're talking about managed this issue of requirements that you be moved? Usually this is requiring that you be moved to the so-called lower level of care, which I'll put that in scare quotes because it's not always a lower level of care, but to a different facility that may be further away than you would like from you know, your hometown or those kinds of things. So Darlene, I, I know you've struggled with this with us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a few things, um, the state did support the, so while the CHTC did not belong to the state, so unlike John's process, um, this process was totally voluntary. It belonged to the hospitals and the health systems. And the way the state was able to lend their support was to issue executive orders and public health orders that said, okay, number one, if the transfer center makes a decision to, to transfer a patient from one facility to another, that decision is enforceable, meaning they would enforce it if, if there was some sort of uh, conflict about, um, about that. So this leads to the discussion around patient choice. And it did happen where we had a patient who said, no way, that, Denver place is too far from where I live. It's over three passes and I'm not going there. Um, no. And it landed on the hospital then to, to talk with that patient about why the transfer needed to happen and then what their options were. Cause then it, it happened then that EMS came to pick up that, that patient for transport. And the patient said, I refuse to go. And, and EMS said, well, I can't take this patient against their will cause that would be assault and or battery. Um, and so, or kidnapping, uh, which we thought was fascinating. Uh, and so um, it, it led to this concept that we had to do informed consent properly. And we had to partner with the state to communicate to our communities and our patients at large this, the seriousness and the true you know, calamity of our capacity situations across our hospitals. And that this transfer wasn't meant to be punitive. It wasn't meant to, to remove their patient rights, but that it was our effort to get them to a place where they could get the care that they need properly. Um, that was the only time that that situation came up because after that, we realized that we had to have a much better messaging campaign that the state needed to be with us and stand behind us. Um, and the, that led to the options where like the hospital, your, your options then are, you can discharge this patient AMA, which feels terrible, of course, to your clinicians, because you know that this patient needs the care that you're wanting to provide, but cannot. Or you then uh, just have to discharge the patient and then escort them out for trespassing when they refuse to leave, which nobody wanted that. So in the end, that for that first patient, um, the patient stayed there, um, or I think actually may have left AMA um, against medical advice. And um, uh, for subsequent situations, we were able to get ahead of it by actually having a prospective discussion with the patient about this is gonna be a possibility just recognize that if you're coming here, we may need to transfer you to other places. On the flip side, on the discharge end, we had to have the same conversations with patients about, we may need to discharge you. You might, I know you live here in Denver, but we may actually need to discharge you mm -hmm. sooner or transfer you to a further uh, a rural community to finish the rest of your care because um, you're, a, you're better in terms of your clinical progress than you know, the, the five other patients who need the much higher level of care. Um, so we're gonna send you there and we'll make arrangements to transport you back. That was the other place where our state was very helpful in um, 
so providing the support where they said that any transfers that happened during this time frame and under this PHO or this public health order would be considered to be emergency medical conditions. And with that, can and should be reimbursable by the payer, um, including the admission or you know, for the facility to accept this patient and also the payment for the transport. Um, I'd love to get to the other angle on this, which is the, the receiving of a patient that you may already be in a facility that is a little bit overwhelmed or maybe a lot overwhelmed, and yet you are the facility that can take care of this patient best given the overall environment. And, um, and, and a, a, a nuanced piece of the executive order in Colorado was that um, you will do this if the combined hospital transfer center says you take them. And I'm wondering, so it was required to take them, but it was also under a voluntary arrangement. So it's kind of both required and voluntary, but, but it happened because of state level support for this voluntary arrangement. And I'm wondering, I wanna turn back to LP because we got a question in the, in the comment also about how this, what is the state's role in this, and did you see similar um, activation of uh, protections for transfer systems like this, or were those discussed and decided against? What, how was your state's um, sort of approach to this in terms of supporting these transfer systems? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, a great question. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, the, in terms of the state's role, we've mostly been outside of you know, working with our governor's office and making sure that we have the right executive orders in place. Um, the ability to declare crisis standards of care actually comes through the director of our agency. It's in rule um, that if uh, we have this process built out where we can make the declaration for crisis standards of care which then of course gives hospitals protections to be able to operate in crisis standards of care. So um, kind of coupled with that, we have our um, scarce resources and, and patient care guidance that I talked about earlier. Um, it, our role has really been in providing the, the guidance pieces for the hospitals, um, facilitating those conversations, trying to help I, this is a horrible way to say it, but I, I kind of felt like our, our medical operations coordination cells were really like kind of brokering, sort of horse trading. I've got this patient. Can you take this patient if um, we take this patient over here? And we so we were just assuring that there was the environment to have those conversations because it didn't really exist before. Um, but we've also tried to, um, because some of these patient transfer situations came up, for example, someone doesn't want to go somewhere. Uh, kind of similar conversations where, all right, I've got this patient, they refuse to be transferred because our hospital is, you know, two hour plane ride away and many, 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 many hours drive away from where, you know, the receiving hospital, um, can we force them to go? And so we had, the hospitals were kind of working that out. And um, so we, updated our guidance document that says when crisis standards of care are in effect, patients opting to receive care may at times need to be transferred, whether voluntarily or involuntarily to other facilities. So our role is kind of giving that permissiveness, Permission. I guess, yeah. for that to occur. That's how we've been looking at it. But fortunately, we've only had really one notable <laughs> A situation where we've had that you know patient refusal to go to a different facility. So what was sort of brokered is what other patients, types of patients, can be transferred to different locations to alleviate some of the burdens that hospital could keep that patient there. So that's what we're trying to help make sure uh, happens. Yeah, Aaron, I want to turn to you because you um, you spoke a little bit during your opening comments about the variation in outcomes for healthcare that we see at baseline before the pandemic. Huge outcome differences between patients who receive care and live in one neighborhood versus those who live and receive care in, an, in another neighborhood. In Chicago, I've seen these maps. I've seen them in New York. I've seen them in Boston. Uh, pretty much every city has these maps that show, you know, you can travel 10 miles and lose 10 years of life expectancy um, by living in one neighborhood versus another. So. Um, to some extent, those disparities are driven by the lack of access 
to high quality care for people who live in those neighborhoods. And during the pandemic, as with so many things, that just got, you know, blown up. Um, sorry, blown up sounds like it got destroyed. It, it, it became exaggerated, right? It was even worse than under normal circumstances. And Darlene, you talked a little about triggers for moving from tier one of transfer to tier two of transfer to tier three of, of transfer. Do we always live at tier one of the need to be able to transfer people better between um, you know, areas where they, they cannot get the quality care they actually need and another area? Or you know, what's the, how do we think about inequities in care that we're trying to mitigate during the pandemic, but that existed before the pandemic? Um, that's a great question, Matt. And I think um, I would answer your question, you know, wanting there to be better equity between populations to say, yes, like we always live at that most, that highest level tier to try to get, um, you know, patients that need a higher level of care to those facilities. We don't, uh, I, let me, let me say this differently. We didn't used to think about racism and structural inequities in healthcare as public health emergencies. I think some of the more recent conversation has changed that a bit. And I think that there is um, a growing acceptance that these are public health emergencies in the same way that an infectious threat becomes a public health emergency. They just exist over much longer periods of time and will require many uh, many, many more ways of coordinating uh, local neighborhood community resources, as well as access to good health care in order to address them. And so I think we have a couple of options. One is to say, well, we didn't create these problems with the COVID crisis. They existed before, and we're just going to accept that there will be differences because they, you know, we've always had differences. I think another thing to say is um, the pandemic has really brought back the conversation or highlighted the conversation again about um, the inequities that we see in medicine, uh, particularly for minoritized communities. You know, and I, I, um, I was actually struggling this morning. I was reading a couple of articles that were written about the, um, the, the today or one of these days recently is the 20th anniversary of unequal, the, the, report um, by the IOM of unequal treatment um, it, it, 20 years ago, noting this very same conversations that we're having today uh, and the lack of significant change that has occurred over those two decades. And so, you know, I think complacency is one approach to that situation and saying, you know, we can't change it. It's always been there and it's always going to be there. Um, or we can take the opportunity to, you um, really continue pushing the envelope on these conversations, keeping them in the public dialogue and in the dialogue of our uh, public health officials, as well as governing officials, to put policies in place that will help us mitigate, if not eliminate, many of those disparities. Darlene, could you tell us what the triggers were for moving from uh, into tier one and then tier one to tier two, tier two to three, tier three. I'm, I just want to put this in the context of like, how bad do things have to be, right? Because yeah, so, things are bad at the baseline. How bad do they have to be to trigger implementation? Yeah. So I, I think this was a, a, a critical thing. So remember that the, the original onus for creating the combined hospital transfer center and then the various tiers within that was really COVID and the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and so the triggers within each tier and even for activation itself was um, hospital med surge or acute care bed capacity, ICU bed capacity, um, and then um, sh staffing shortages. Uh, so like okay. taking into consideration those factors um, and oh, sorry. And then also um, hospitalizations. So availability of beds, and COVID hospitalizations were the original triggers for activation. So when it reached a certain threshold um, of cases, but not, but you know, we still had a lot of capacity, the CHTC did not need to be activated. But once we hit a certain threshold of numbers of community cases and also COVID hospitalizations, and then also, you know, a decline in the capacity, that was that was the trigger for the activation of the CHTC at tier one. Now 
in 2021, the CHTC leads recognized that um, COVID hospitalizations were at most 20% of mm -hmm. the cases that were becoming hospitalized and were not gonna be the major driver of capacity issues in this year. Were they gonna add to the fire? Yeah, make it hotter? Yeah, absolutely. But they made the decision in 2021 to expand um, what could be transferred through the CHTC and remove the limitation or restriction that it could only be COVID patients um, and open it up to everything. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I would say th those were the triggers and the thresholds originally. Um, what remained in terms of the triggers and moving from tier one to tier three then became ICU and bed capacity and really honing in on those things because those are what would precipitate a hospital to say, I, I, can't, I don't have the staff or the beds available to care for this patient, I need to transfer that. So as we were seeing those levels happening statewide, that's what um, triggered us to move from the, the tier one where it was just a partnership to tier three where it's statewide all hands are on deck, every bed is on deck um, for examination as a possible available bed. Um, John, did you have a similar set of uh, triggering events that led to escalations of the sort of enforcement of the, of the C4 operations? Well, again, we didn't have um, any, once the governor's emergency orders went away, we didn't have any involuntary actions that the C4 could take. Um, so basically the C4 was always open for business. It's just the volume of business they received, um, you know, was definite, was directly related to what the, you know, conditions in the hospitals were. Um, the daily conversations though, amongst the critical care and, and bed placement folks on our daily calls, the tenor of those obviously, you know, changed dramatically, you know, as, as the surges became more mm -hmm. uh, intensive and impressive and, you um, you know, again, there was a lot of great collegial problem solving, but uh, we, like many states, Arizona, Utah, others, you know, found some limits to, you know, the voluntary actions. Um, you know, I just want to make a quick comment about the the equity, you know, issues. Yeah. It's funny because, you know, at least in our area, um, we have really good cooperation amongst the hospitals. So, I mean, Sherry Fink's article, you know, about the Los Angeles hospital situation, I, I think was very instructive that's not the case, you know, necessarily in, in all metro areas. But from an emergency care standpoint, you know, our um, non-majority populations in inner city Minneapolis are always minutes away from, you know, some of the most outstanding trauma and critical care facilities in, in the state. And yet, you know, our rural populations, while they might have better access in some ways to primary care or monoclonal antibodies or things like that because they have a car um, and they have a primary care provider, but if they get severely ill or injured, um, you know, they're, they're not going to get, um, on any given day, they're not gonna get the timeliness and the aggressiveness of care uh, that they would if they happen to be in, in a downtown metropolitan area. And with COVID, we saw, you know, pretty significant transfer delays that, that compounded some of those things, despite the best efforts. And, and I will call out, I mean, telemedicine uh, and other techniques can, can help to keep patients in place at some of these facilities, but it has its limits. I mean, you can't operate on somebody remotely. You can't do dialysis, you know, and, and most of the time, um, you know, it was better for me at, you know, Hennepin to add one more intubated patient to the patients I was boarding in the ED, you know, then let that patient sit uh, in a rural emergency department with providers that had extraordinarily limited critical care experience. Even if they were getting good advice over the phone, they just couldn't match the transfusion and laboratory and, and other resources that, you know, we had. So, um, but at the same time, we couldn't accept an unlimited number of those, you know, patients. Uh, as soon as you would take a patient, um, and, and we got our hands slapped for this all the time, but you just try to do the right thing in the moment. If we really felt like we were uniquely, you know, able to provide the resource, we, we would try to do that. And C4 accepted all um, medical um, transfer requests, COVID and non-COVID, but trauma burn pediatric, those needed to go directly to the specialty facilities. And so we really tried to make sure that we always took uh, the bad trauma, the bad burns, hyperbaric, you know, things that we were uniquely uh, positioned to accept. So, but it was, you know, I tell you, I mean, some of the, Matt, I, um, we all have tough shifts in the ED, but, you know, for, 
a couple of months there, like every shift you walked into, you just knew it was going to be one of the worst shifts of your life. And you were just struggling, you know, to hang on to, okay, I've got a dialysis patient who's in an abnormal rhythm. I've got no monitor beds to put him in in the ED. Um, I guess we'll put him in a chair here temporarily until we can, you know, get this person moved. Uh, it, it was, you know, really some of the most difficult medicine, uh, chaotic medicine I've ever practiced. So I'm, I'm pretty grateful that we're on the downswing now. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things you're raising too, John, is the layered nature of the problem here and the transferring patients from one place to another. It has to be a component. The telemedicine is also a component. One of the questions that came up in the chat is around EMS um, strategies because transferring people takes an EMS resource. Um, and during these surges, our EMS teams were swamped as well. And I don't, do, do, I don't know if anyone would like to try and address that, but how did, uh, you know, how did the different uh, locales represented here deal with EMS limitations in the context of, you know, need, maybe a need for more transfers than they normally would be doing. And, and by the way, some of these transfers are long distance. So you're taking an EMS crew out of operation for a day. Yeah, we were really burning out a lot of the uh, rural EMS agencies and a lot of the limited critical care transport resources we had were uh, pretty overwhelmed to the point where we actually brought in some federal ambulance uh, contract teams in order to uh, support them and, and supplant them in some cases. And initially that was a little bit controversial, but in the end, um, a lot of the municipalities were really grateful not to have to worry about it so they could maintain their 911 coverage and, and not have to worry about, you know, being out of their service area for six hours. But day after day, you know, often these volunteer or, or smaller services would be out of their, um, you know, immediate response area for the better part of a day, making a transfer halfway across the state. So I think that's, that's something we really need to continue, you know, to work on. At the same time, some of our flight crews were getting called into hospitals saying, hey, we've got to transfer from this place to this place. And when they get there, it was really clear they get the patient intubated and all that, but it was really clear that no transfer had been accepted. Um, and then they were stuck in a situation where we can't remain out of service. You know, is this patient abandonment? And it's like, well, technically, no. I mean, there, there's a doctor there, um, but it, it led to some pretty dicey um, circumstances sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, and I'll, I can chime in on that a little bit also. Yeah. I mean, definitely echo many of John's uh, comments. You know, in Idaho, I think about 40% of our EMS uh, providers are volunteer EMS providers as well, which also layers in another um, you know, issue that we have to address. But in, in our, at the state, we license all EMS facilities and um, personnel as well. So we have a really good you know, pulse on what's going on with our EMS providers and uh, similar conversations being pulled out of their, um, you know, their community service opportunity by needing to transfer patients, um, things like that. But luckily, the volume of our transfers wasn't so extensive that we were really taxing our EMS personnel for long periods of time like that. Um, and just as a, you know, I kept continually asking our staff, how, how are EMS doing? How are they handling this? And for the most part, we've experienced is that they are so anxious and eager to step up to the plate that they were kind of thriving in the environment <laughs> uh, in sort of a, a, I don't want to say a weird way, but <laughs> they were, um, you know, proud and happy to be part of the solution. So we didn't really have any major issues, but that might also just be, the luck of the draw for our state that we didn't have quite the, the volume of patient transfer needs that many of the other states have had. I realize we're getting very close, unfortunately, to the end. So um, I, I would like, though, for each of you to have an opportunity to say a word um, in closing about um, maybe, maybe we can tackle one of the questions in the chat uh, while also tackling what we said we were going to. Um, one of the questioners asked, what are the barriers to learning from this experience and applying what we've learned to um, to the usual care that we provide in the in you know normal crises of American healthcare, um, and what is the lesson that has been learned? What have we what will we take forward out of this? Um, not just for pandemic, but for 
you know, the post pandemic era, what, what are we gonna have learned from this? Maybe I'll start with Aaron because we haven't heard from you in a couple minutes. Um, what do you think we ought to take from this into the future? Um, thanks, Matt. I think that's a great question to add on, to end on. Um, I think for me, and I'll, I'll 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 start with what you questioned earliest, which is what are the ethical underpinnings of the work that we're doing? And I think for me, one of the barriers and um, ways to move forward is getting better public recognition and dialogue around principles of um, communitarianism, of solidarity, of um, ideas that are less driven by individual interest, which is how we operate, I think, in the healthcare system on a regular basis. That's not to say that individuals should not want their, um, their own healthcare uh, addressed, but that I think that we have to be able to have a conversation and a dialogue that's readily accessible, like good public messaging on the in the onset of a, of a public health emergency, that we're moving to a state where our individual interests might not be maybe served, but not in the way that we're used to, in order to make sure that other people in the public community that we live in and we're part of and we have some obligation towards um, may need those resources that we usually would get, that we might need a substitute that will be good enough, uh, but not, not not maybe what what we expected. And I think, uh, you know, being able to have messaging and conversations that gets that point out um, early in a public health emergency uh, will overcome one barrier and potentially help us move forward. I have a ton of other barriers, but I'm sure they're going to come up in other uh, other comments. So I'll stop there. Elke, I know you have a hard stop uh, in just a couple minutes. So why don't we go to you next? If I, if I can get myself off mute here, my apologies. Um, I, I would say, I mean, I'll start with, for me, lessons learned and kind of moving forward out of this is, um, Having experienced our, our healthcare system here in the state prior to this and that kind of that isolating, we're going to do it on our own. Um, I, what we are really learning is that hospitals don't need to feel alone in making some of these hard decisions that they have now this infrastructure and established system and relationships that we hope that will continue beyond well beyond the pandemic. So that if a doctor or hospital needs help, they know that they have a network of peers that can help them. So to me, that's like the our biggest win out of out of this. Um, we have you know problem solving channels, uh, barriers. I would say that at least at the state level, we don't have um, you know, at least the the technical experts on my own staff that could stand up a center, a transfer center like this, other than helping be a facilitator of those conversations. And you know what would it take to be able to do something like that in the future? And when I look at you know what Minnesota is doing, for example, or the state of Washington has something similar, what would it take to to stand that up? Um, just a couple of things that come to mind. Thank you, John. I know you also have to chair another meeting in just a minute, so we'll go to you next, and then Darlene will get the last word. Yeah, I think um, we've got to figure out how to maintain like the C four and some of these, you know. Um, concordant operations. I've never seen during this pandemic such incredible examples of selflessness combined with examples of selfishness um, in sort of the same vein, you know, and I, it's really going to take a public-private partnership in order to make these systems function the way they're intended to. In the absence of the correct, um, you know, immunity protections from the things like the uh, restraining order that was, you know, put in place, we really aren't going to be able to do any kind of effective um, allocation of resources, and uh, so finding you know the the right orders versus the right degree of voluntary cooperation you know amongst the uh, the private sector entities is critical. And the same goes from an equity lens. You know we've we have so much to do from an equity standpoint, but the private sector is not going to solve that. And so unless we you know, have a major public commitment um, you know, to solving some of these issues, it, it's not gonna happen. But I think we have uh, a lot of things that, that were done right that we can build on, um, but we gotta make some tweaks and, and make sure that that Delta, you know, when the system is at the verge of falling apart, um, that we really are trying to offer as consistent care as possible to everyone. Yeah, it's really, you're making me think this really is one of those paradigm issues of structures 
underlying legal structures even that end up driving, you know, people have to behave in their individual interests, which will lead inevitably to disparities and the neglect of already underserved and under-resourced communities. Um, so it, it, it takes proactive intervention, um, not just letting the system run as it does, because the system running as it does is, is what has created these disparities to begin with. So sorry, Darlene, that was my last comment. Um, I'll turn, I'll go to you for the, the actual last word. Yeah, I, I will say that uh, to me, the lesson that we have to take away from this is that we need to continue to elevate the core mission that we all have together as a healthcare industry, which is every patient deserves to get the care that they need at that moment at the right time. And that was the center of the commitment mm -hmm. that, and I, in my mind, was the public private partnership that John described that we should be seeking all the time. That was the core principle that brought our hospitals and health systems together and allowed us to partner with the state and the state provided the foundation for us to continue mm -hmm. that and to innovate around that core principle. So. Well, thank you all so much for joining. I uh, will turn back to Charlotte. I think there's a closing comment uh, on, on the part of the program. Yes, thank you, Matt, and thanks to the panelists remaining with us and, and recently with us for this really wonderful exploration of the experience that people have had, which we know is going to be important to learn from for the perhaps very near and certainly foreseeable future as these circumstances recur. And um, we wanted to invite our um, <clears throat> our participants this time to come to next month's or the following month's programs. And uh, Kelsey Berry is going to tell you about that program. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Charlotte. And thank you, Matt, and all the panelists for really helping us explore this cooperative approach to regional resource scarcity. I think that both the possibilities and the ethical complexities that it raises are, are really ripe for continuing to discuss them. Um, so we do hope you will enjoy uh, the upcoming consortium events. The next one's in March, uh, and it's going to continue today's theme of innovative organizational responses to COVID-19. So we're welcoming Dr. Susan Miller, who will share how Houston Methodist um, developed the nation's first mandatory vaccination policy for a healthcare system. Uh, and then in April, which is the last meeting of the Organizational Ethics Consortium, we're going to come back to themes of trust, trustworthiness, and how health organizations can publicly communicate to serve those ends. And for that, we're going to have a really unique case of a biopharmaceutical manufacturer kind of looking internally at their communications and thinking through trustworthiness and trust. Um, so the dates for those programs can be found on our websites and via the listserv. Uh, and we're just so thrilled to have you as part of our learning community and look forward to seeing you at these upcoming events of the consortium. So thank you so much and have a good afternoon.